Let's give the mothers a big, big round of applause again. I know that a lot of mothers are actually in kid zone and thought zone because they're having an amazing, amazing uh, thing happening out there as well. And if you are visiting us for the first time, we really want to warmly welcome you. Uh, and today is an important day because it is Mother's Day. You know, uh, three kids were just comparing their fathers and who was the stronger father. So some kids say, wait till you see my father. I bet you my father can beat up your father. And then one, uh, so they were saying all this. And then one little kid said that, you know what? I bet you my mother can beat up your father. So there you are. <laughs> Praise God. Now today, even as we celebrate Mother's Day, uh, I felt that I wanted to bring across another slightly different message. It's a little bit different from all the normal Mother's Day uh, messages that I've probably given. Actually, the best gift uh, you can give to me, I, I, I'm, I'm hinting, of course, you know, just now uh, Daniel said that the uh, husbands must do all the housework. Actually, by right, my husband should have done the preaching. Don't you agree? It's <laughs> But he said, someone has to do it, so here am I as usual. But he's a great guy, he's a great guy, don't, don't, don't complain. But today, even as uh, I was preparing for this uh, to talk, share about, I just felt that I had to slant the message slightly differently because we're talking about a new era. And this new era, we're introducing almost an entirely new generation. So one of the things I wanted to do really was to introduce to you some of the amazing uh, next generation people that are actually in our church. And uh, yesterday's service at 14-year-old Nicole, you should have heard her speak. She really was amazing. And this morning, I had Emily Quack, and she's 19, and, and she really shared something. You know, Nicole shared about the search for identity, and uh, Emily shared about the need for even a, a really to know what are the standards to live by. And today, at, at this service, I have a wonderful young man. So those two were girls. I thought I better not be so girl biased. I know I love to have girls, but I don't have any, but never mind. Uh, I get to eat the last pie, so that's good. <laughs> but today, I thought I'd introduce a young man. This is a really wonderful young man. Wesley is a great young man. Come on, give him a big round of applause. Yeah, great young man. And uh, he's one of our interns. In case you didn't know, we have an internship program. And Wesley is one of our interns serving uh, under Narrow Street. And really, today, even as... How old are you? I keep forgetting. I say I'm so old. 21. Wow, he's 21. And, and he's about to go to study in Australia. He'll be leaving oh, us UK. to... UK, not Australia. Oh, sorry, sorry. <laughs> UK, it's different, yes. Uh, he's about to go to study in UK. And, and we really want you to really listen to his heart. I told each of these young people to share with us what faith means to them, just in case we forget that they are looking for faith. So take it on. All right. Hello. Hello. All right. Um, so Come on, give him a big round of applause yeah. first. Give him a big round of applause. They're all scared stiff. They're all scared stiff. Yeah, Wesley, scared. you can do it. <laughs> Come on, show them. Okay, so uh, being born in a Christian family, I had, I had the privilege of going to church to attend conferences and like various camps. But relying on, God, uh, on encountering God just during camps and conferences is, I believe, is never enough. Because um, I believe that faith is living out that encounter when you leave camp and con that conference. It is living out the truth that, you person that I personally encountered in a world of lies. It is very important to keep my faith in God every day because just as it was mentioned in the Bible where Jesus talked about the parable of the sower, I can be like one of those um, plants where the seed was just sown in the rocky ground and when I, when I just leave, leave my house, leave my family and work, I can just um, fall because I don't have a root in, in God. Or I can be like the seed sown into the thorns where the pleasures of the world will just suck me away from, wow. from God's love. Therefore, my faith in God is very important because I believe a real fulfilled Christian life is one that is lived out in Him through a constant ongoing relationship with God in my ups and downs. And of course, in result, I, I would bear much fruit and live, his live in His purpose. So I'm supposed to share one thing, what SIV has done to help build my faith in God. Well, You can yeah. also share what we haven't done or so. Lah. What we haven't done. Lah. <laughs> okay, I will just say what you have done, then you just think what I have, I, you guys haven't done. Lah. <laughs> yeah, read between the lines. Okay, um, one thing the church has done is, um, is believing and investing in the youth. One thing I love about Narrow Street, or in fact, yeah, actually Narrow Street, I don't know about the other ministries, lah, but it is a ministry for the youth by the youth. Therefore, I had the privilege to be to serve, to be part of the worship team, to be a leader of Narrow Street. 
And just by serving in Narrow Street, I definitely had to rely on God a lot because we are all human, so we all fail. I went through, a, I mean, I'm sure if you serve God, you will go through difficulties and you will really have to rely on God. And when I, when I encounter all these difficulties and like, um, even as an intern, like losing stuff, yeah, losing keys, and yeah, see, my GM is laughing, and yeah, a lot of st- a lot of ang- difficulties. Um, I had to really rely on God, and sometimes I come to the point of God, why is it so hard to serve you? I mean, serving should be very easy, right? But you know what? Through through all these difficulties, God really put through everything, and and the best place to fail is in church because the grace of God is really there, and um, yeah. But you should not try to fail, lah. I mean, yeah, don't, don't, don't go to church and fail. I mean, you just, you just know, lah, that um, even though uh, you are human, God still, God, God is still God, lah. Yeah, and um, through this, I learned how to trust in Him, and I can definitely apply it when I leave to study in the UK, where I can really rely on God in everything I do when I'm alone, without, um, without the people I know with, no nothing, no familiar, just alone, yeah. Just living alone. Yeah. So, one thing I really hope that SRB will continue to invest in the youth and, and trust them and encourage them because I definitely see the fruits um, in Narrow Street itself, like seeing all the other youths really grow. It's because we entrust them with something that um, they really also have to rely on God. Yeah. Wow, that's, that's really good. Yeah, come on, give the bestie a really big round of applause. Amen. I pray that you heard what is in his heart and what he has just said. One of the great things is to in, let the youth really be involved, let them participate, let them serve. Parents do not stop them from serving because it's not enough to have some conferences and some feel-good factors. They really need to get out there to dirty their hands and that is what makes a difference. And, and really, we want to be a church that's generational. You know, there are three big rocks or three essential ingredients about SIB. One is spiritual disciplines, one is sabasar, but the third one is about the generations. Amen? Amen. Say generations. Come on, say louder. Generations. And if there's anyone else who is a young, uh, 25 years and below, we want to salute you today. And even as we pray for him, and, and we're going to really pray and release this anointing even over the church. Father, we want to thank you, Lord God, that truly the generations in SIB are connected. We thank you for the young, oh Lord God, even as we celebrate Mother's Day. We thank you for the children the mothers have had. And so, Lord, we want to thank you. We want to ask you to give us wisdom to even help this generation grow up so that they, yes, they have godly values. So yes, they will not just be a second-hand Christian or second-generation Christian, but they'll have first-hand faith of God and they'll have a first-hand encounter with God that will help them to negotiate life's difficult journey. And so all God's people shout, Amen. Thank you so much, Wesley. Thank you. We'll call you back again, huh? okay? Don't be scared. <laughs> Praise God. You know, uh, The young people, as you know, are very close to Pastor Chiu and my heart. But, you know, one of the problems is that as we begin to, as SIB finishes its 20th year and enters a new era, we're totally in a different era. And one of the most amazing, important things that we need to be awakened about is that in this new era, we're also coming into an understanding of young people that are so different from us. And we should not be scared about that, but we should rejoice, but we should know what it's all about and what has happened in the previous era. Every previous era affects the next era. And the other reason, therefore, why I also would like to release this is that there are many, many young mothers in our midst today. How many mothers here are only 35 years and below? Just just raise your hand towards me. 35 years and below. Mothers who are 35 years. Lindy, I thought you're still 35. Okay. 35 years and below. Raise your hands. Come on. Why don't you stand? Stand up, come on. Look at these young mothers, 35 years and below. Stand up, mothers, because it's not a lot of them. But I want you to really clap and applaud them. Amen. Look at these mothers, 35 years and below. Okay, like 40 years and below. So, Kala Lindy can stand like 40 years and below. Now, I want you, yes, you can sit down. But I want to tell you this, mothers, those 40 years and below, it is a lot harder 
to raise the next generation. And one of the things that I felt as someone who has really taken this church from one generation and now into the next generation, I thought I want to share with you today something very deep in my heart, something I cannot take for granted, the question of whether or not after we have gone, whether we have left behind a godly generation. So Father Lord, we ask you to be with us this morning, even as we ask these difficult questions. Will we be able to leave behind a godly legacy? We thank you, Lord. You are the giver of all understanding and wisdom. So we ask you to be with us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, as Daniel led that last part of that bridge of that song, break my heart for what breaks yours in case I forget. Immediately, one of the things I think that's breaking God's heart is parents without courage and young children without a compass. Just think about that and we'll come back to it. Parents without courage and young people without a compass. That will break God's heart. I want to introduce to you today the millennial generation or generation IY. What is the millennial generation or generation IY? They are the ones that are born around about 1980, so roughly it's about 1984 to 2002, but actually it spans from about 1980s right up to about 2000 and whatever, all right, to the, to, to the millennial age. This generation is truly very different from the previous generation because of many, many factors. And one of the things is that we need to be awakened to realize that they form half of the world's population. Half of the world's population is below 25 years of age. And, you know, I just want to do a quick uh, uh, survey and say, how many of you here are below 25 years of age? Can you just stand up? Pastor Chu wants to know how many below 25s he has in the church. Come on, stand up. Stand up tall and strong. We salute you. Come on. Whoa. Come on. Look at them. Look at them. These are the children, that, uh, these are the people that are below 25 years of age, but they look at it and they don't form even 10% of our population. We really thank you. Thank you so much for standing up. But we want you to know, this is the generation that's going to be the largest dominating population in the world that we are, going to, we are entering in, in this new era that we're entering in. They will represent 3 billion people and growing. It will probably be far more than that because they will go on to be parents. They will go on to have children. They're also the biggest consumers in the world And that is why all these statistics have come out From actually the market researchers Forbes came up with these statistics Because they wanted to do a big market research About the millennial generation Their buying habits, their eating habits The way they shop, the way they think And because of this, they're targeting them And so this generation will be the most targeted generation As far as marketing and sales is concerned this generation make up as much as 75% of the U.S. workforce by 2025. And one of the most interesting things about this generation is that they're highly electronic. Incidentally, if you never got a reply from my WhatsApp group, it's because I dropped my handphone into the toilet. I just resurrected it by soaking it and burying it in rice. But the point is I'm making is that this is a totally internet generation. If they drop their handphones in the toilet, they would probably cry for the next three days, even as it died. And in this generation, it is not about uh, whether it's good or bad. It's really about a fact that we have to come to recognize. And, you know, recently someone showed me that uh, a primary three students were given a test. And in this test, they were given this question. What are the three things that human beings must have in order to survive? So it started with A, W, and F. So if you and I, we would have answered, if we were in primary three in our days and our teacher asked us, what are the three essential things that human beings need to survive? We said, you being a school teacher, you would have told me the answer is A is for air. W is for water. F is for food, but not today's generation. A is for Apple, W is for WhatsApp, and F is for Facebook. So that is what they live by. And forget about food, water, and air. And so we enter a whole new world. So even as we enter this whole new world, it behoves us in this generation, it behoves people like me in this generation to ask this important question. What is it? Can I assume that whatever we are doing in church, even as you hear Wesley share about just concerts and all these kind of things, how can we, can we assume that whatever we are doing here, how can we be convinced, how can we be assured that when we leave this stage, that there will be a godly generation coming after us? And I'll be honest with you, as I thought about that question, I realized that there are certain assumptions I cannot make. 
And that is why I began to study about Lot because God just provoked me to read about Lot and ask me some soul-searching questions which I believe that even as a parent in this generation, we must ask these questions. Whether we are parents, we are leaders of the church, whether we are elders of the church, these are important questions that we need to ask. And so turn with me now to the book of Luke. We are still in the book of Luke. And I'm just going to read just a few verses from Luke chapter 17. And even as we read these verses, I'll tell you why I've chosen the story of Lot to speak on Mother's Day. Luke chapter 17, and Luke 17 verse 22 onwards, Jesus is really talking about the end times, the times when the Son of Man will be coming back again. And so he goes on to explain that when the Son of Man comes, it will be like in the days of two Old Testament figures, Noah and Lot. So in verse 26, he says, just as it was in the days of Noah, so it will be in the days of the Son of Man. And by verse 28, he then gives us this verse, uh, this thought, as it was in the days of Lot, people were eating, drinking, buying and selling, planting and building. But the day Lot left Sodom, fire and sulfur rained down from heaven and destroyed them all. It will be just like this on the day the Son of Man is revealed, on that day, uh, sorry, on that day, no one who is in the roof of his house with his goods uh, inside should go down to get them. Likewise, no one in the field should go back for anything. Remember Lot's wife. Whoever tries to keep his life will lose it, and whoever loses his life will preserve it. So what is the reason why I chose this passage? Number one is because, as I said to you, this is about generations. Lot has a great beginning. He started off as a nephew and, uh, and his uncle was none other than Abraham. And so he had a great godly heritage. And if we read about him, really Abraham must have been one of the most astounding figures in, the, in, in just human history. Because Abraham is one of those few people that is said in the Bible that God spoke to him face to face as a man would speak to a friend. Fancy having that as your uncle. It must have been outstanding. The godly atmosphere, the godly influence must have been outstanding. It must have been incredible if Lot had just heard some of the stories and some of the things that, that Abraham would have recounted to him. Nevertheless, even with such a great beginning, Lot had a very tragic ending. Because right in Genesis, we read, and when we hear about Lot, it's in Genesis chapter 12. By the time we hear about Lot in Genesis 19, both his daughters committed incest with him and gave birth to a very ungodly, almost wicked generation called the Moabites and the Ammonites. And so it behoves me to ask myself a very serious question. Can I assume that I will leave behind a godly generation? The second reason why I decided also to use Mother's Day, to, apart from the fact that this is the only time I have to do this, is that Jesus also said, remember Lot's wife. Husbands, please don't look at your wife. She's not Lot's wife. Really, it's not about uh, comparing to Lot. It's really about when Jesus said that, the importance of women. Every woman, whether you are married, not married, whether you are have children, don't have children, need to wake up and realize women make a lot of difference to the, really to the whole atmosphere of a church, of a family. Women contribute or do not contribute to eternity. In fact, the Bible says he who finds a wife finds a good thing because a wife will make all the difference. Imagine if Lot's wife had not turned back to look at Sodom and Gomorrah. Imagine if she had never become a pillar of salt. Do you know what would have happened? The two daughters would not have committed incest. There would not have been any more bites or any, any more ammonites. But just because Lot's wife could not hold it when the crunch came, everything was lost. That's why I'm a big believer in women's groups. I'm not here just to have women's groups for women's group six. I'm a big believer in building women. That's why I take women's conferences. I will take my ladies on mission trips because I'm absolutely clear that if you want to see the survival of a generation, even a home, it all depends on the women. I myself have ministered to so many women in my lifetime and I began to realize that if a woman rises up to faith 
everything, no matter what happened to her husband, he could have lost his faith, he could have walked away from home, his children could have run up and down, but if she kept her faith, that family has hope. But when women do nothing about their own faith and just fall by the wayside, that family, no matter how godly, and I've seen it with my own eyes, how godly the husband, actually, that family has very little hope. The third thing I reason, of course, why I want to mention and use the story of Lot is because Jesus talks about the days of Lot as comparable to the end days. And I think you and I need to, uh, we don't need prophecies, we don't need prophets to come and tell us we're already living in the end days. And the end days are serious days, difficult days. Just before the coming of the Lord, you and I have seen and literally an unfolding of unprecedented wickedness that we have never, never seen before. And so Jesus begins to prepare his disciples for the end days and he says, remember the days of Lot. Even in the days of Lot, as it says in Luke chapter 17, people were going about business as usual. They were just marrying, they were given in marriage, they, had, uh, they were eating, they were drinking, they were holidaying, they were working, the economy they were planting, they were building, they were building the economy. Nothing had changed. But in the midst of that, something else had changed. And that is why when I talk about passing a legacy to the next generation, we must be aware of the times we live in of the kids that we are passing our legacy to, and even of ourselves as husbands and wives and as parents, as mothers and fathers. So turn with me now and let's examine Lot a little bit. Let's look at Genesis chapter 13, where we're introduced to Lot and his relationship with Abraham. The question is, who is Lot? In chapter 12 of Genesis verse 4, we are told that when Abraham left Ur of the Chaldees after the Lord spoke to him, uh, Lot went with Abraham. Lot was 75 years old when he set up from Haran. And in verse 5, he took his wife Sarah and his nephew Lot and all the possessions, possessions they had accumulated. And then in verse 13 comes a scenario in the life of Lot. By then, Lot was a grown man. He had married. He had his own household. He had his own possessions. And it says in chapter 13, verse 5, Now Lot was moving about with Abraham, also had his own flocks and herds and tents, and he went to his uncle and asked to be separated, or rather to be moved out from him, and to really have another uh, area for him to grow his own uh, property. And so Abraham said to Lot, Sure, if you go the left, I will go to the right. That was in verse 9. And if you go to the right, I will go to the left. And in verse 10, Lot looked up and saw that the whole plain of the Jordan was well watered. And he looked at it like the garden of the Lord. In other words, when Lot looked at the whole plain of Jordan where Sodom was, it was like paradise. Garden of the Lord means paradise. And really, the and it was like the land of Egypt. It's the most happening place in the world towards Zohar. You know, it's a bit like, you know, some of us, you know, when we think of Australia, we will say, oh, you know what? We need to go to Australia because the sun, the, the climate is better. And the coffee, hmm, just the word coffee in Australia makes me, wow, you know. The coffee is better. Not only is the coffee better, the coffee machines are better. The education is better. The politics is better. The government is better. And even the devil is better in Australia. And that is exactly what happened. And so lo and behold, Lot left the, uh, uh, the uncle and began to pitch his tent towards Sodom. And the rest is history. Now, who is Lot? The Bible tells us a description of Lot in the New Testament. In 2 Peter, Lot is described as a righteous man. So let's look at 2 Peter. And here you hear a description of Lot in 2 Peter chapter 2, verse 7. Lot lived right and was greatly troubled by the terrible way those wicked people were living. He was a good man and day after day he suffered because of the evil things he saw and heard. So the Lord rescued him. And in NASB it says, And if he rescued righteous Lot, distressed and oppressed by the sensual conduct of unprincipled men. So who is Lot? Lot was not just any other Christian. He was not just any other believer. He was a great, righteous man. He was a man that lived righteously. It's described he lived right. He was a good man. He was a righteous man. And not only was he a righteous man, 
He was even a righteous man who hated what he saw out in the streets. He didn't like the lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah. He, in fact, reviles against the lifestyle of Sodom and Gomorrah. He would, maybe when he was having, uh, you know, discussions in his family or in his cell group, he probably said, oh, those terrible people. It almost, you know, when I read about that, the Lord almost said, put this in my heart and says, Lord is very like the church today. In the church today, a good church like ours, we are honestly, we are righteous men, we are godly, we want, we have God fearing. But you know what? We even are more than that. We actually look at the world outside and we begin to say, Whoa, so terrible, so terrible. What a terrible world out there. What a terrible world out there. But yet, God, a lot, could not influence his world. And that is what really strikes me. And that is what really caught my attention. And it was as if God was saying to me, I want you to understand this. Do not assume that just because your church has all the trappings of righteousness and you have all these things that you think is about righteousness and you even don't like what is happening out there. And every time we come into conversation, we shudder at what's happening out there. Don't assume that you are able to leave behind a godly heritage. Lot had it all and yet he lost it all. He lost his wealth. He lost his wife. He lost his children. He lost everything. He lost his legacy. So the question then, when God began to search my heart about this story, was to ask God, how come? How come such a godly man ended up with an ungodly legacy? God tried his best to save him. And just by the skin of the teeth, only Lot was rescued. How come? How come? And I came up, with just three thoughts. And these are my thoughts, they're personal thoughts. And even as I studied this story, as I searched the heart of God, I came up with three thoughts. And the first is really this. When I think about Lot, I think about his separation from the godly influence of Abraham. As you heard me say, Abraham was one of the, the epitome of faith, a father of faith. And yet, Lot lost it all. You know, it reminds me very much of second generation Christians. Be aware. Do not think that just because your parents had faith that you will naturally just have it. Second reason was that he underestimated the power of spiritual darkness. And I'll try my best to describe it. I spent a whole session with the leaders on spiritual darkness. I realized that we do not realize how serious is spiritual darkness. And the third thing, of course, is about secularized spirituality. So I'm going to try and explore each of them a bit at a time. The first is separation from God, uh, from, Lot, uh, from godly influence. Look at chapter 13 again. It says here, in chapter 13, when Lot went up to Sodom, verse 11, so Lot chose for himself the whole plain of the Jordan and set out towards the east. And then it says in verse 11, and the two men parted company. You know when it says that the two men parted company, it is a very powerful statement. It means that Lot went this way and Abraham went this way. And for the first time in Lot's life, the influence and the godliness, the times that Abraham would have spent with God was never seen in his life again, could not influence him again. It was as if this beautiful God atmosphere that Abraham had with God was now totally removed from Lot. In fact, Lot chose it. Lot actually no longer came under the godly atmosphere of Abraham's household. And you know something? The Lord's really spoken to my heart. He says one of the most in important things for parents to understand, even as you bring up children, is not how great is their education, whether they have tuition or not, it's whether or not they are linked to a godly influence. And if parents do not make it a point to encourage their children to go to church, let the children go to narrow street, even when exams are on. Let, do not take them away just because there's tuition. You know, our, our young people, you know, in narrow street, the leaders of narrow street, the biggest problem is fighting parents. Because parents will not let kids go to, church, uh, go to narrow street. The moment there's an exam, the moment there's tuition, do you know what? The moment there's even a birthday party. And even if there is uh, some kind of wonderful thing, a competition for some kind of award, you know what's happening? We have just removed the child from godly influence. It's not about how great the church is. It's not about that. Every church is, is still the same. But you know what? God is still in the house. 
God is still in the house. And if there are godly people in the house, they influence the atmosphere. And when parents do not want, you know, I want to say to young parents, I want to say with all my heart, and I pray, even if, you know, in the second service, Emily said, it's not the teachings, it's not the teachings, it is the sharing of our lives. So I'm going to share this with you, young parents. Do not stop your baby, do not stop bringing your babies to church just because it's going to cry, just train them. Uh, I have done it, I've had brought my children when as young as a baby to church, I've sat them there with us for many years when we never had kid zone, never had taught zone. And I want to say this to you. You cannot stop coming to church just because your baby had little sniffle and the flu. Just because you think that your, your three-year-old uh, cannot make it because you just prepare them for church. And you do not stop bringing your children to church just because there's a swimming competition this weekend. Just because there's a birthday party this weekend. You do not do that because the only chance for you and the only chance for your child to come under some kind of godly influence is that godly atmosphere. You know, in fact, you know, as I study the Bible, as I read the stories of wars and of King Jehoshaphat and even of this great story in Joel where they say, blow the trumpet, call a fast. Do you know what the Joel actually summons the people of Israel to do? Bring your children, even those who are on the sucking at the breast. In us, even you are know, breastfeeding. There's no excuse not to bring your kids to the prayer meetings. And that's why I would say to my young adults, do not be afraid of prayer meetings that are 2 to 4 a.m. Bring the kids along. Bring them along. Let them sleep in the presence of a godly atmosphere. What could be more glorious than the fact that God is in the house? And do you know something? I just was so stuck. I, I have seen people do that. I've seen Kevin and Adele did that to their children. I've seen Willie and Tati do that. I saw Pastor Inky. Her, his, her grandson was only a baby when your mom was only a baby when he brought Daniel to the prayer meetings. And your mom has all overnight prayer meetings. She has nothing but overnight prayer meetings. You should meet Lindy's mom. And this little Daniel, she would just say, oh, it's okay, he can sleep there. He was two years old, three years old. And do you know what? Daniel slept under this God atmosphere. And up to today, Daniel is a young man, right? 18, 19, 18 years old, I think. And he's still godly. Why? Because he was not separated from a godly influence. And so I would say this to you, this is an important point, and Lot lost it. The moment he separated himself from his godly uncle, he was now exposed to the second major problem, and that's spiritual darkness. You see, spiritual darkness is very dark. But unfortunately, we do not see it as dark. Because spiritual darkness means spiritually it's dark, but physically it's light. In fact, spiritual darkness is quite happening thing. Sodom was one of the most happening cities in the world because in that, you know, you hear of uh, in Genesis chapter 13 when Lot looked at Sodom and that, uh, whoa, it's like New York. I'm going to New York, but it's okay. Uh, it's like New York, it's like Shanghai, it's like Paris. It was the most happening thing in the world. It was like paradise on earth. It was amazing, but it was not seen as dark. It was in fact light. In fact, you know what? The Bible tells us about Sodom and Gomorrah. Do not think of Sodom and Gomorrah just about its perversity of sex. Actually, that is the end of that journey. Start with the beginning. Look at Ezekiel, what it says about Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was basically a very rich city. It was thriving. Its economy, its, its commerce was amazing. They had abundant food. It was the most happening. They had the best cafes. They had the best eating places. They had these hip, hip joints, you know, that, that you see in Bangsa South. We were in Bangsa South yesterday. And all these amazing places. They had it all. It was filled with carelessness and it was filled with ease. It was filled with luxuries. Careless ease means luxuries. Nothing wrong with that. But the only problem with us human beings is this, that we don't realize that we love the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Because with such luxury, with such abundance, with such great economies, they became proud. And when they became proud, they also began to seek out alternative lifestyles. Because life became boring. They must try something new. And when they sought out alternative lifestyles, they also did not realize they were oppressing the poor and needy. And this is something that's very important. Because even as a church, even as we hate the, uh, all these terrible things that happens out there, is our heart broken about things that God is broken about? One of the things that happens in an economy of the world at the moment 
is what I call the whole economy of the world is driven by exorbitant greed. Long, long ago, if your company earned hundreds of thousands or even millions, you would say you'd be very, very happy. Am I not right, Uncle Kuntat? Right? If they earn millions, they would be rejoicing. They would just give big hong pao's and everything to their staff. But today's companies want profits in the billions. When companies want exorbitant profits, somebody has to pay the price. Unfortunately, it is the young. They pay the price of relentless work. But even more sad to me is to understand the whole realm of human trafficking. Last, uh, uh, two years ago, when everybody was praying for the elections, the Lord began to break my heart about migrant labor in Malaysia. And, and the Lord just said to me, human trafficking does not start overnight. It starts with the way we look at migrant labor and the way we treat migrant labors. And so the Lord began you know, to move my heart. And so when I had my UAM retreat last year, I had a night of prayer about human trafficking. And that's when I discovered some very gross facts about human trafficking. You see, human trafficking means that we take in a laborer and we reduce his wages, if possible, to zero so that our profits can be very big. What I want us to realize is that when luxury sets in, just like luxury goods are made in Bangladesh, people actually pay a price for that. The poor are oppressed. And so one of the ladies said to me, even in Malaysia, there are some people who will bring in migrant labor and then bluffing the people in Bangladesh and all these places that they'll get them jobs in the estates in Malaysia. But actually, no. When the migrant laborers arrive in Malaysia, they're sold off to the highest bidder. And these middlemen sell them off to companies who want cheap labor and who will chain them up and really put them onto chains and, 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 and make them work without, sometimes without wages, sometimes with minimal food, sometimes with just gross. Uh, it's actually human slavery. And another girl at that, uh, at that uh, prayer meeting began to share. She works on the oil uh, and gas industry and she described how in the oil rigs in Trungano and offshore there, they often have to rescue these uh, people, these migrant laborers have been enslaved. They often have to rescue them because they will jump off the, 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 those uh, factories and, and swim to those rigs. And there would be sometimes at least 10 a day or whatever and they would have to rescue them and then they're back they go to that cycle of slave trade. And what God is saying to us, wickedness does not start, it's not just about sexual perversion. Wickedness starts when we are so comfortable with our lives that we forget how our comfort has come. Wickedness is wickedness when we pay no attention to the very poor and the very needy. And that is where wickedness really is. And you know, let's look at that slide again on spiritual darkness. Not only was that as people become proud and they think that they have it in life, they can begin to defy God. And so in Isaiah, we read that the sin of Sodom was that they were blatantly sinning and unashamed. You know, it reminds me a bit about this woman that was in Pataling Street and took off all her clothes. Really, you know, to me, it is not about her. It is about the condition of the world today. It speaks to me. Are we living in spiritual darkness? Well, think about it. And so sexual perversion is but the next stage of our defiance of God. But you know something? Why is it that Lot could not defeat the system? Now, turn with me to chapter 19, where this story really is about, of Genesis. In chapter 19, we begin to see Lot encountering spiritual darkness. Now, Lot, when he moved to Sodom, one a day, in verse 19, in chapter 19, verse 1, two angels arrived at Sodom in the evening, and Lot was sitting in the gateway of the city. And when he saw them, he got up to meet them and bowed them down with his face to the ground and, and uh, pleaded with them to come stay in his house. And so he took them in. And even as he prepared a meal for them and taking, uh, baking bread for them, and they sat down to eat, in verse 4, just as they were about to go to bed, and look at this, all the men, everybody say all the men, from every part of the city of Sodom, both young and old, surrounded the house. They called to Lot, where are the men who came to you tonight? Bring them out to us so that we can have sex with them. Blatant sin, unashamed. But look at the 
the, the, the depth of it or the, the wideness of it, the, de- the, the width of it, it says here, all the men from every part of the city, both young and old. That means there must have been teenagers involved in this. There must have been old men as old as 60, 70 years old involved in this. It was so pervasive. Spiritual darkness, when it comes, no one is spared. No one is spared. And that was the truth. So when they came to this a lot, they began to ask Lot to really give him uh, to have sex with these men. Now Lot went inside to meet them, went outside to meet them and shut the door behind him. And he said to them, No, my friends, don't do this wicked thing. Look I, nev- look, I have two daughters who have never slept with a man. Let me bring them out to you and you can do what you like with them. But don't do anything to these men. But listen to this statement of Lot. Lot, we told, we, we read just now, was a righteous man who was very, very upset with all that was happening outside. In fact, Lot was one step better. In the midst of such sexual promiscuity, he actually trained his daughters to be virgins. But now comes the pressure. As spiritual darkness reaches his home and knocks on his door, now, whether or not he had real godliness, now it makes a difference. Did Lot, why was it that Lot could not defeat spiritual darkness? Very simple, as pastor always says, you can never curse the darkness. You need to let your light shine. Ladies and gentlemen, the sad part is this. Do not assume that you have enough light to pierce that darkness. Lot did not have enough light. When the crunch came and darkness stopped on his doors, he surrendered his two virgin daughters to be raped. Wow, wow, he did not have the ability to withstand that darkness. Second thing that happened, these two men, uh, or rather these men, began to say, get out of your way, they replied in verse um, 9. This fellow came as an alien and now he wants to teach us what to do. We'll treat him as, and, and make him learn a lesson from us. And they kept bringing pressure on Lot and moved forward to break down the door. What we need to wake up and understand, that spiritual darkness will knock on the doors of the church, will knock on the doors of every home that thinks it is godly enough. It will begin even to put pressure on us. The worst pressure facing the world today is not the pressure on our teens, it's the pressure on the parents. This kind of pressure will cause us and to open our doors to spiritual darkness. Because let me give you a, you know, Look at Lot, even when he tried to save his uh, sons-in-law, he went out in verse, uh, we are told in verse 18, uh, Lot went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, and the sons-in-law thought he was joking. And that is spiritual darkness. And I want to show you a diagram about spiritual darkness. Spiritual darkness, as I said, does not look dark to normal eyes. In fact, it is light. It is beautiful. It is full of luxury. It's about luxury goods, luxury cars, luxury houses. It's all about gadgets. It's all about eating and drinking. It's all about the economy. But who controls the spiritual realm? The spiritual realm is actually a more important realm than the physical realm. The spiritual realm is only controlled by two sources, and human beings have to choose. John Melindy says, Spiritual darkness reigns over a realm when that people on that part of the city or that place rejects God. Because only two people can control the spiritual realm, God or the devil. So when people reject God, and if there are not enough people receiving God, but most people have rejected God, that whole realm is filled with spiritual darkness. So if you ask me, why is the world so dark today? Because a lot of people have rejected God. And that is why the world is filled with spiritual darkness. The other thing we need to understand is that when there is spiritual darkness, it is Satan who is in control. 1 John 5.19 is a verse worth memorizing. You know, we love to memorize only one verse in the Bible, but I suggest another verse. 1 John 5 verse 19. You might want to look it up in your Bible because this is the clue to understanding spiritual darkness. 1 John 5, 19 is a very interesting verse because John starts by saying, and we know that we are children of God, but the whole world is under the control of the evil one. So in other words, John is saying, you are a child of God, but can you shine in the midst of a world controlled by the evil one? And as you look at this poor lot, small little lot, sitting in the midst of such darkness. Worldviews are basically views controlled by the devil. 
When the devil controls the whole spiritual realm, he is able to deceive, he is able to distort truths, and he is able to persuade men to deny God. It's very simple, and to defy God as well. And so if you are Lord alone there, you cannot defeat darkness. In fact, you know, I asked the Lord, the Lord, when Abraham interceded for Sodom and Gomorrah, Abraham asked God, if there are 30 righteous men, will you spare Sodom? And God said, yes. And he went on, if there are 20, will you spare? So he went down right up to 10. And I always wonder, why did he stop at 10? I think it's because Abraham understand the power of critical mass. In other words, for a city as wicked as Sodom, for a city as big as Sodom, and we don't really, I don't know the population of Sodom. It might have been, definitely it's more than 3,000. It might be 30,000. It might be even 300,000. It was one of those big cities in those times. For a city as big as Sodom, and for wickedness so pervasive as in Sodom, the minimal number needed to be bright enough to shine its light and to defeat darkness was 10 righteous people. But in a city of 30,000 or 300,000, not even 10 could be found. You know, brothers and sisters, sometimes I also shudder. I also shudder because when I look at the number of people who come to prayer, I also shudder. And I look at the number of people who don't even read the Bibles, I also shudder. Connection with God and we don't even read the Bible, I also shudder. There must be a critical mass because wickedness or spiritual darkness is controlled by the devil. And it requires enough people to burn that altar, to lift and pierce through the darkness so that there is an open heaven. And that is what we're doing at the moment. That is what your 24 7 is about. I want to say to every zone leader, I want to say to every cell member, it behoves you to come to learn to pierce that darkness. It behoves you to come. You know, one of the sad things is not just about spiritual darkness. It's also about secularized spirituality. But before I go there, I'll share with you an incident that just happened about a month ago. I was having tea with John Mulindi, preparing for him to come uh, to do a conference or to do, teach us again how to build those altars of prayer. And he was just sharing with me about, uh, a few of us were having tea, and he was sharing with us about an incident that happened to him when he was invited to speak in Germany, round about, I think, 2002, 2003. I can't remember exactly when. And he didn't want to go to this conference. It was a very well-organized conference by very godly evangelicals, men of God in Germany. And, but he, the Lord told him, go, go to that conference. So he went. And when he went to the conference, as the conference went on, one day he was traveling from the hotel to the conference site. And in the morning, as he woke up to travel from the uh, hotel to the conference site, he no noticed an unusual air of uh, celebration, an unusual air of just uh, a lot of activity in the streets. So he asked his host, why is there so much people on the streets today? And the host said to him, today is the gay pride parade. Notice the words the homosexual society call themselves, they don't call themselves anything more than gay pride. Remember I said that it doesn't begin with sexual perversity, it begins with the arrogance of human life. And so he then just thought nothing of it, so they went to the conference, and by lunchtime when they came out for lunch, he noticed that the streets were not just full of people, that they were full of naked people. Men and women who were walking stark naked. And when I heard that, I was like, oh no, How, are you sure that happened? How could it happen? And uh, Cookie Hub's wife was sitting next to me, Celine, says, did you see it in Vancouver? I said, praise God, I didn't see it in Vancouver. But what was even worse was later on, and, and, and the host said to uh, John Mulindy, but John Mulindy says, wow, that's gross. And, John, and the host said to John Mulindy, wait till the night comes. That is when you see it at its worst. So sure enough, at night, they had to go back to the conference site for the night meetings. And even as they were driving from the hotel to the conference for the night meetings, he could not believe his eyes what he saw. Blatantly, openly, men making love with men, women with women, men and women, men and, and, and with kids, everything. Uh, all that you could imagine, he said, all that you could imagine. It, they were drunk, of course, they were drunk, otherwise they couldn't have done it. They were drunk. They were just abasing themselves. There was blatant revelry. 
And on top of it, there was rape going on. Now, pastor asked me, are you sure he said rape? Yes, he said rape. And rape is rape. And, and why isn't the police doing anything? Because it was a lifestyle. It was a lifestyle of that city. And it was so gross. And didn't know what to do. Anyway, he went back with his host to the conference site. Uh, and the conference at that time, the night meeting was really about debriefing about what had happened in the conference. And they were there to debrief. These godly men had gathered to say, what do you think we should share to the conference? What is God saying to us after three days of conference? What is God saying to us that we should tell the German church? And so each one went round to say, well, yeah, I think God is saying this, saying that. And it came to John Melindy's turn, and they turned to him and said, Pastor John, uh, do you have a word for the, 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 the meetings that we're going to have tomorrow? And John just by that time burst down and cried and cried and cried and cried. I could understand him because I myself was just so shocked that I too almost felt like, how could this happen? And after, as he cried, he, he said, you know, I realized I was in the midst of a godly man and these are my hosts. I, I felt so ashamed of myself for crying. So I gathered myself together and I said these to these men seated with me. He said, how could you even think of what to share next when you're not broken about what is happening out there? How could you even think of continuing with the conference if you do not, your heart is not gripped with what is happening out there. And this is where spiritual darkness has a way of numbing us, blinding our eyes, that even when there is wickedness, we actually say it's all about human rights. We actually say it's all about being modern. We actually say it's all about just being, yeah, modern, fashionable. Incidentally, please do not wear shorts to church. I just cannot handle it. I've seen young mothers wearing shorts to church, real shorts. I honestly cannot handle it. I say it with, all, with respect for you and with honor for our Lord. I just can't handle it. Respect the house of God. Respect the children that you bring along. Do not wear shorts to church, however fashionable that is. Because I think we owe it to the Lord to model decency. What is it? that has caused the church to be able to accept that. And that is called secularized spirituality. If we had not had secularized spirituality, actually Lot could have defeated darkness. So what is secularized spirituality? Secularized spirituality is actually a very simple thing. It is merely called worldly Christianity. But many of us look at worldly Christianity as the way on the outside. But I beg to defer. Worldly Christianity is not what is happening on the outside, because that's nothing, but what's happening on the inside. The most serious part about secular Christianity is simply this, that the world is more to be trusted than God. And therefore, you look to the world and the worldviews to make choices and to form your opinions. In other words, when you look at the difficult decisions to make about education, about marriage, about work, about employment, about the way you run your business. We begin to look at the world's model rather than God's model. So what is a world secularized Christian? What is a worldview orientated Christian? Well, very simple. Jesus said to us, if you're in the world, you should not be of the world. A secular Christian or a secularized Christian is one who is in the world and like the world, and loves the world. That's all it is. And so one of the things I realized is that maybe I just want to very simply explain what is secularized spirituality. Just two thoughts. Number one, a secularized Christian is just someone who begins to have disconnected himself from God. So he begins to say, wow, you know, uh, I look at the plane of, uh, I look at Abraham, he's just moving about in tents, and I look at Sodom, gosh, I cannot be moving like that. I, I just don't have faith for doing it. I need to connect with the world. Do you know something about prayer? I want to say this about prayer. Prayer is nothing more than this. Prayer is just us connecting with God, finding faith again in God, allowing God's wisdom to penetrate us. And so that as we penetrate us, we begin to be connected to God. And as we are connected to God, we are disconnected from the world and its opinions and its views. You never find in the Bible that Lot prayed or called on the name of the Lord. You hear Abraham calling on the name of the Lord, but you never see Lot calling on the name 
of the Lord. And you know something? If you read Genesis chapter 13, when you hear that in verse 11, he chose to move his tents to pitch near Sodom. In verse 12, he parted company from his, uh, uh, his uncle. In verse 13, now Sodom was a wicked place. Do you know something? When we're disconnected from God, we cannot see that Sodom was wicked. He couldn't see it. He had no perception. He had no understanding. He had no perspective of Sodom. It just looked like a very nice happening city. And that is why prayerlessness is a very simple thing. Prayerlessness is merely disconnecting from the wisdom and the perspective of God and connecting to the world. That is secular Christianity. I want to add one more thing. I was teaching my zone leaders on roots and wings, and we came to uh, second jo uh, 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 has this verse, Love not the world, nor the things that in the world, for uh, when you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You know, just now I said, remember Lot's wife. I believe Lot's wife was a good wife, but one of the problems of Lot's wife was this, she loved the world. And the word love is not just love, is agape, it's unconditional love. It's giving everything to love the world, everything that the world has to offer. She loved the world so much that the world was inside her. She could not leave the world. It clung on to her. And that is why when she saw all of it happen, she simply could not leave it behind. And she then she looked back. Why? Because the when we love the world so much, it's impossible to really love God in the same way. No man can serve two masters. The heart of humankind is not big enough to love the world and love God equally. Impossible. Impossible. The second thing about secularized Christianity, and let's keep that slide on, on secularized Christianity and about worldviews, is really this more troubling thought, which is that secular spirituality Causes us to adopt worldviews and opinions to shape the way we parent. And one of the saddest things about parenting from a worldview is that without faith in God, most mothers, as a pastor has said, are worrisome. Actually, we worry a lot. Women by nature are worriers. And we, ought, we live more in fear than in faith, unless we have more faith than fear. And so one of the sad things that happened in the, 19, the last 25 years is the way children have been parented. One of the ways they've been parented is to overprotect their children. It's called safe parenting or fail, fail, uh, fear, fear, uh, rather foolproof parenting. Never let your child fail. So if you never let your child fail, the child must be overprotected, must be overprovided, must be overloved, send them to the best schools, best tuition, best this, best that, and really give them the best. And in the course of it, never teach them responsibilities. Don't let them do housework because it's going to be exam. Uh, don't, don't let them uh, go and help the poor because the poor is dirty and, 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 and you know, I mean, they're poor. All these things will happen. And as a result, we produce a generation of kids that are under tremendous pressure. Not only is that, one of the worldview that came out on parenting in the 1950s is Dr. Benjamin Spock. Dr. Benjamin Spock basically talked about self-esteem and began to make every mother worry or not whether they were good enough mothers, whether they were affirming their children or not, whether they were loving their children or not. And they made the child the idol or the, or the king of the house. Incidentally, don't call your children the king. You are the king, father. And you are the queen, mother. The child is still the child. Don't ever make your child the king and queen of the house. They need you to be parents. As a result of this, a whole parenting style changed whereby they wanted the child to be affirmed, to be loved, and produce children who were over-affirmed and over-loved. And even the child was also stressed out to know that they were the best. Now, I want to read you an excerpt from this very excellent book by Tim Elmore called Generation IY. Tim Elmore speaks about the 25 years of parenting uh, that has been extremely damaging. He says here, one of the things that has happened in the last 25 years has been to cause children to be exposed to fierce competitive, uh, competitiveness. Now, why is that so? The reason for this is this. Secularized Christianity means you need to define success according to the world. 
So how does the world define success for your children? They must have the best jobs. They must be the most competitive. They must be able to sing, dance, act, swim, do a talent time, be American Idol, and yet achieve top grades. How else can you compete in this difficult world? You must send them to every possible tuition in the world. And not, not only that, the world defines success is that he must be a celebrity. So do you know what? You must be liked and loved. And the kid, you know why today's kids, when they will fall apart, when they post something up on, Insta, or on Instagram or Facebook and people put unlike or no like. You know what children are looking for today? They are seeing the, how many Facebook friends have I got. If I have 3,000 Facebook friends and Pastor Chu has 30,000 Facebook friends, boom! Oh dear, nobody loves me. That is the world they're growing up in. And you know what? I need to post up the food that I eat. I don't care whether I have money to eat it or not. I need to post up this amazing food that I eat. And I need to tell the whole world about my holidays because that's very happening. That's what the world is looking for. That defines my identity. And that is why I was so sad to hear my 21-year-old young man. So I have a group of young 20s. And he told me how he has friends who actually don't have money in the home. The parents are not wealthy. The parents, in fact, are in debt. They are suffering. But this, his friends, is prepared to borrow money to go on holiday. Why? Because parents have looked to the world to define a child's identity. You should have listened yesterday to Nicole discuss issues on identity. She searches for identity. She searches for values in her life. You have heard Wesley say, I search for something that will hold on to me more than conferences, more than even uh, just some gigs out there. Something that will give me values in life, something that will give me a compass to live on. And if we don't do that, children are under stress. Let me continue. The, the children who are under stress, basically, they know they are the best, they've been told they're the best, and now they have to live up to be the best. According to researchers, 70% of teenagers today really feel that they are worried a lot about their future. They worry about their future more than they worry about sex. And many of them cannot sleep. And he then says about this, what if this generation grows up and never finds a healthy way to handle all this pressure? What if as adults they continue to seek and find artificial ways to cope? Will America have a large percentage of adults with chronic depression? Will the majority of adults in 20 years from now be addicted to prescription drugs as a means to handle feeling overwhelmed? They were overloved, overprotected, overprovided, given cars, given money, given clothes, given everything, but they are overwhelmed. And what if they perpetually want to return to their adolescent years? to escape marriages, job commitments, and legal obligations? What if adult life just doesn't suit them well because we didn't prepare them to be adults? I wonder if we'll see normal responsibilities today reduced to bite-sized chunks in the future. Make jobs, make marriages, make commitments. Marriage licenses maybe should only last three years. And perhaps their children will have as many as six fathers, each only managing to be a father for three years. Jobs may be reduced to just a serial contractual projects, each lasting no more than six months. You know, as I read this, it is indeed a frightening thing. The statistics don't show well. These are statistics provided. 98% of young people today feel very overwhelmed. 44% find it so depressed, they find it hard to study. 10% have tried suicide. And one of the saddest things, I, the reason why I share all this is because I do know what's happening in my young people. They talk to me. And one of the saddest things is that they come from very good homes, godly homes, homes that are really good. They don't even come from dysfunctional homes. They are great homes, godly homes, two-parent homes. And really in the midst of that, I have children who really want to cut themselves up. They, they, just, they just take a blade and they just cut themselves themselves up and, and when you, they ask them why they just you know what it is because when Jesus said remember Lot's wife Lot's wife was a good mother but she did not have faith in God so she was filled with fear so she was really trying to produce a kid that was overprotected and overprovided but as a result of that the child had all the external trappings but he did not have a soul the soul of the child was God and when I speak to these young children who are into self-mutilation they actually tell me, I don't know who I am. I'm looking for identity. I'm looking for purpose. 
It's not enough just to have good grades and just to get a job. I don't know. I just don't know. Now, the good news is this. The good news, because of this, today's millennial kids are very different from my generation. They have great desires to be purposeful. They are value-driven. They want to make a difference in the world. I want the next slide up. The great potential of the millennials is this, and you and I need to wake up as parents to this. Do not stop your child from pursuing purpose and values. And when I say values, I mean you need to let them live it. You heard, you heard what Wesley said. Wesley basically has said, where did I learn to negotiate my Christian life? Not in conferences, not in just teachings, but in doing in participating, in helping the other kids, in helping the poor, in going out to street feeding. Do you know something? LifeGen is so excited because LifeGen, the last three weeks, the spirit break out, we sent LifeGen or LifeGen went out and they began to pray for every person on the street in SS2. And people were healed. And LifeGen people just jumped up and down. In fact, one LifeGen leader, when he saw this Bangladeshi man healed, he himself, I cannot believe it, and the Bangladeshi man had to say to him, look, I am healed, look, I'm jumping up and down. And he was so shocked. You're healed? You're really healed? And not only that, the Bangladeshi man said to him, give me your handful. He said, why? Because I've got many friends who need prayer. This is what the young people are looking for. Purpose, value-driven. 63% of millennials want the employer to contribute to social or ethical causes. Gigi, that's what is encouraging them. They also care about what's genuine and authentic. 87.5% of millennials disagreed with the statement that money is the best measure of success. And they're willing to encounter danger. They want to die for a cause. And that is why ISIS have been very successful in recruiting young people. Do you know when you study, the whole BBC has done a great study and research on why comfortable Western educated, comfortable homes in UK can produce ISIS uh, fighters. The real reason is that these people are looking for a purpose to live for. They don't care if the purpose is not godly because nobody told them. They just want to live for a purpose. They don't want this uh, frustrating life in the West of just being comfortable, having jobs and yet having nowhere to go. They're looking for identity. They're looking, they're willing to take danger. But the most important thing I found was that young people need to be connected. And that's where you and I, the older people, need to wake up. They need to be connected. One of the most important things about young people is that they love connectivity. They are always on their handphones, they're always on WhatsApp groups, they're always on, on chat groups. Why? Because they need connectivity. I found out that in I the ISIS fighters, even though ISIS is very good on YouTubes and all that, the real thing is that a lot of these kids who watch the YouTube videos actually don't go out to Syria and fight. The ones who go out to Syria and fight are the ones who have met a physical person, another adult, another human fighter who have began to share with them the stories and their world just opens up and they have gone out to fight. And so what it tells me is this, young people do need a connection across the generations. And if you, you know, I realize that young people, they will follow whoever will connect with them. And the sad part is that if bad people connect with them, they also follow. If godly people connect with them, they also follow. I look at Wesley. He's looking for models. He's looking at us as adults and says, will you be able to stand against the worldview? He's looking at us and saying, will you be able to resist spiritual darkness? And if you and I, as parents, give in to spiritual darkness, give in to worldviews, then they have no hope. You know, I was praying for one mother in the second service and she was in tears because as she heard it, she realized that like all of us as mothers, we realize the mistakes we've made. And I said this to her, I too have made a lot of mistakes. But one thing God said to me when my children were growing up and as, even as they're growing up, my, God said this to me, the main thing Lord said to me is this, you must keep your convictions high and clear and visible. Show them what you believe in. Live it out. Don't just talk about it because they are watching. And when they watch our convictions, they watch us hold on to the God views of life and don't give up on the world views of life. They know there's something they want. Amen? Wesley? Amen? Come, Wesley, come up here. Come up here. Just before you come, uh, Wesley, I'm just going to share a story. I know I'm a bit long. Do you have time for a story? There's a very good story. I want to end with a very good note. This key is actually connecting our young people with the other generations. So Tim Elmore in his book has lots of things to say, but he tells a story about his daughter Bethany. 
So it says that when my daughter Bethany was 13, my wife and I noticed it was time to be intentional about introducing other voices into her life besides our own. We wanted adult voices to influence her choices, not just peer voices or the worldviews. So we made what was probably the smartest parenting decision of our lives. We decided to ask six women in Bethany's life, women that she thought were cool and that her mother and I respected and indeed were godly to mentor her. It didn't take us long to choose these six women. So next I called each one of these women and asked if they would take a day to invest in our daughter's life. If they worked outside the home, I suggested that they take Bethany to work with them. In fact, they would put her to work. All I asked was that each woman would share one life message with our daughter, something she wished someone had shared with her when she was 13. These women were amazing. Not only did they all say yes, but they did for her more than what we could have asked for. Sarah was a nurse. She took Bethany to a hospital, maternity ward, where she actually helped mothers give birth. Later that afternoon, Sarah took Bethany to a class for unwed mothers, many of them young teens who were far from ready for the responsibility of motherhood. When Bethany heard their stories and the tragedies of their lives, she made a crucial decision and impacted her that she would keep herself pure before marriage. It was something that was so profound that no one could have shared with her. Holly was another mentor that took Bethany to downtown Atlanta where they worked in the projects all day among underprivileged families. Betsy was a flight attendant and they took Bethany her on a flight to New York. At the end of the year, we, shared, uh, we hosted a dinner and invited all these women to our house to say thanks to them. Bethany cooked a meal and served them. Then we um, went to the living room and in, it was time to share about the past year. At this point, Bethany's job was to sit in the middle of the room and with all her mentors around her, she had written for each one a personal thank you note. And she wanted to thank them for what had significant lessons she remembered from their time together. Needless to say, it was a deeply moving time. When Bethany had finished reading, I agreed, uh, opened up the scriptures and shared with them how Jewish families used to give a blessing to their children uh, many years ago. Before I could suggest that we pray for Bethany, all the women crowded around her and began to bless her and began to speak God's word into her. There wasn't a dry eye that night in the room. As the evening ended, Bethany presented each of her mentors with a gift. It was a memorable sight. In fact, that year, with her mentors, con uh, her mentors continued to make a difference in my daughter's life, even up to now. I smiled as I talked with my son, Jonathan. Jonathan is younger than Bethany by four years. That night, Jonathan had watched the events of the evening in wonderment. As I pulled the blanket over Jonathan, and as I wanted to say goodnight to him, he looked up at me and said, Dad, I've already picked my six guys. You know, I just want to share this because it's a beautiful story. If we want to pass a legacy, we must connect. And they need more than parents. This church has plenty of fathers and mothers. You need to invest in the next generation. Wesley, come here. Wesley is a young man intern in our church. And I would say to the elders as well as to the pastors of this church and even to any of you leaders, he's going to be going off to UK in September. You still have time. You still have time. Invest in his life. Talk to him. Take him to your workplace. Tell him what are some, and you ask them, what are some of the crucial mistakes that you made? Don't try to teach him. Just share life with him. And this is a beautiful moment. And I'm going to ask really all the 25 years old to stand up. All of you who are 25 years old and below, why don't you stand up? I want you to stand up so that we can look at you and we can bless you. Amen? Um, let's look at all the 25 years old and let's stretch our hands to them. I want to bless the 25 years old. I want those of you, who, even as you look at, uh, at Wesley, to stretch your hands towards him and to the 20, 25 years and below. And even actually if you're 30 years and below, I want you to stand up as well. And you stretch your hands to them and begin to pray for them. Let's pray in tongues, shall we? Let's pray in tongues. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, Father, we are so blessed, O oh Lord God, that we have the younger generation in our midst, O oh Lord God. 
Father, we believe, O oh Lord God, this will be a godly generation. This generation will be able to pierce the darkness. They'll be a relentless generation. They will not give in to the worldviews. Father, we bless them. We connect with them. We will model for them. We will stand with them. We will we share our lives with them. We will be their friends. We will be their counselors, O oh Lord God. Father, we bless this young generation. Father, we bless them, O oh Lord God. In Jesus' name. And now, you know, young people, I want you to join and Wesley in praying for the fathers and mothers. Wesley's going to represent. Wesley, you can do it. You can do it. Yeah, Nicole had to do it. Uh, and then Emily had to do it. So now you also have to do it. Now. Can I, can I? Okay, now, Wesley's going to represent the young generation. And they love us. They love us. They believe in us. And they want to see us hold that flag up high for them. So they're going to pray for us. So all the young people, you just join Wesley in praying for us. Father Lord, I just want to thank you, Lord, for, for our parents, Lord, for our fathers and mothers, Lord, in this church, Lord. I pray, Lord, even as we look to them, Lord, that they will look to you, Lord, that they will get their strength from you, Lord. That I pray, Lord, that um, even as we, as we learn today from the sermon, Lord, that they, they will just um, they will be godly parents, Lord, that they will raise us up the right way, Lord. I pray, Lord, even, even as... As most people become a parent and they don't know they don't know what to do, I pray, Lord, you just give them the wisdom, Lord, give them the knowledge, Lord, and I pray, Lord, that um, they will just um, always rely on you, Lord, and have a da daily walk with you, Lord, and also uh, have a good example for us to follow, Lord. I pray, Lord, even as we young people, Lord, that we will we will just appreciate them, Lord, that um, even though sometimes our fathers and mothers may fail, I pray, Lord, that that. We will just forgive them, Lord, because you've forgiven us, Lord. I pray, Lord, that um, we will we'll have this relationship with our parents, just as your son Jesus had a relationship with you, Lord. And we'll just, we just love you and that they will love us, Lord. And I pray, Lord, that, um, yeah, you just be with us in this relationship, Lord. May you be the centre, Lord. And, yeah, just, just bless us, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And young people, give your parents a big hug and, and really Amen. say, I believe in you, I will walk with you. Thank you so much. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Why don't we all stand? Hallelujah. I just want to say this. Even as Pastor Lichu and I prepare for the pass on to the next generation, we need to work on this together so that after 20 years, we don't want to just stop short of what God wants us to do. Why do we believe that the next generation will lift the church higher? Amen. We lift the church higher to the next level and we will begin to believe in a young amen believe in a young we have so much to learn we think in the wisdom of god to know what to do connect with them connect love them believe in them amen hallelujah let's sing this song amen hallelujah thank you jesus thank you god i look to you i won't be overwhelmed
that we will be well and we will leave a rich godly legacy to our children from generations to generations. Amen. Hallelujah. I'm going to ask Father Nietzsche to close us now. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, Lord. Father, we realize, O oh Lord God, that if God be for us, who can be against us? We need not fear the darkness. We only need to shine our light, O oh Lord God. And Father, there are more than 10 people here whose light will shine in this darkness. Father, we bless every parent. We bless every family. We bless every young person. We bless, O oh Lord God, because Lord, you are able to do it with us, O oh Lord God. So Father, we want to connect with you, O oh Lord. We want to connect with you, O oh Lord God, so that we will have wisdom. We will have a God perspective of life. We will be able to defeat the devil's schemes and vices, O oh Lord God, because we will have a God perspective. We will have greater wisdom, O oh Lord God. Father, we bless you, Lord. We thank you, O oh Lord God. Why don't you lift your hands to God? I want you to lift your hands to God as a sign that you are going to connect with God. That is how you're going to defeat the world. That's how you'll not be affected by the world views. As you lift your hand to God, it's a sign. It is telling God, God, I need wisdom. You know, this is an amazing song. If you don't look to the Lord, you will be overwhelmed. But when you look to the Lord, He will give you vision. So ask the Lord, give me vision. Give me vision, Lord. Give me vision. Help me to see. Give me wisdom. Give me wisdom to manage my life. Give me wisdom to be a parent. And you know what the good news the Bible says? He will give it liberally without finding fault. Whoa! Everybody say amen. 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 I will love you, Lord, my strength. I will love you, Lord. to bless you more. God bless you. Have a wonderful, wonderful weekend.